You want me to make my opinion right now known? I think within the next three years, every single one of the aforementioned seven schools will be out of the ACC. You heard it, man. I don't know exactly when it's going to go down, but I'd be surprised that in 2035, the year before that grant of rights deal is up in the ACC, I'd be really surprised if the, quote, magnificent seven is still a part of the Atlantic Coast Conference. Welcome to Always College Football. I'm Greg McElroy. Along with me, as always, is Mark Kubiak, Jack Foster, Jake Garcia. Everybody's here, so we appreciate you taking some time to be with us. Today's a big picture show. We're going to talk the business of college football. We're going to talk about the possibility of realignment. We're going to talk about the possibility of playing games internationally. Where can the sport grow? We're also going to talk a little bit about an apparel deal involving Notre Dame and why some think it might be a little different than some of the apparel deals that have been negotiated in the last 10 to 12 to 15 to 20 years. So a lot of moving parts, bigger picture, not going to dive into the X's and O's, not going to dive into the teams and the games, not today. We talk the sport and the business of college football and we'll do so without wasting any more time. Let's talk about it. The Magnificent Seven. That's what we've now coined the seven teams that are trying to look into possibly getting out of their current ACC grant of rights deal in an effort to align with a conference that could provide them with a little bit more economic stability. Now, here's one aspect of it that I don't feel like a ton of people are talking about, man. Where exactly are these teams going to go? Now, they're going to sit here and say, well, we just want more money. So everyone naturally is going to look at Clemson. They're look look at Florida State. They're going to say, well, given the footprint, given their excited fan base, their, their energy, they're a natural fit to the SEC. But I think there'd be a lot of teams in the SEC that would really push back on the inclusion of teams that are already covered in the footprint. South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida are accounted for. There's absolutely no reason at this point for the SEC to add brands. Why? Because are you technically diluting a product that is already remarkably profitable? That's the question that needs to be asked. The other aspect of it is if the Big Ten wants to naturally align, culturally, would Clemson and Florida State be the right fit? These are all questions that are being weighed right now because all the ACC commissioners Uh, The ACC commissioner, the ACC presidents, the ACC athletic directors are all down right now at Amelia Island trying to figure out what's next for the conference. Now, Jim Phillips, the commissioner of the ACC, is in a remarkably difficult spot. He had nothing to do with the grant of rights being signed all the way through 2036. He had nothing to do with them signing basically everything away with exclusivity to ESPN and the Walt Disney Company for the better part of a decade and change. This was all in an effort to launch the ACC network. They felt like if they launched the ACC network, they would be on equal footing with that of the Big Ten and the SEC. They were wrong. However, it's understandable right now why some of these teams are starting to see into the future and being concerned about where they're going to stand 10, 8, 6 years from now. If the gap that exists between the SEC and the ACC is at least $30 million per school, that compounded over time is going to leave most of these schools in the ACC way behind, economically speaking. Let's talk about a few things that have been kind of addressed so far. So far, a lot of teams, those Magnificent Seven, they've already approached the ACC and they say they want to have an unequal share of revenue. That's not going to work. You look at every conference that has been successful. Why do you think the Big 12 ultimately broke apart from where it was several years ago when Missouri and Texas A&M left? Why did they do that? Because at that point, Texas had launched the Longhorn Network. Texas had received a larger piece of the pie. Therefore, Texas A&M felt spurned. They decided to look elsewhere, and they have now naturally shifted into the Southeastern Conference seamlessly. Missouri felt the exact same way. They needed a partner. And at that time, conference expansion was all about households. Missouri could add St. Louis. Missouri could add Kansas City. 
Those two households would put those into the SEC footprint with the launch of the SEC network coming up a couple years later. That was significant. So natural inclusion for those two schools in the SEC back in the day. That was all because Texas and Oklahoma essentially demanded more. We need to understand that a unequal revenue distribution is not going to work. It's not. Now, the ACC, they need to survive, right? They need to protect their actual footprint in and of itself. But you start distributing 30% here, 10% here, and you start basically going off of brand names alone, that's not going to work. Even in the SEC, does Missouri pull as much weight as a Georgia? Does Missouri pull as much weight as a Florida or an Alabama? No, but they all feel like they have an equal seat at the table because that's what is best going to allow these schools to remain competitive. In the Big Ten, it's the exact same thing. Is Northwestern sports as valuable ultimately to the Big Ten as Ohio State or as Penn State or Michigan or USC? No, but they're not having a sliding scale because for the long-term health of the league, that's not a sustainable model. That's number one. Number two, these number seven, these seven schools right now, as we look at the seven schools, where are they ultimately going to go? I already referenced the fact that the SEC would be a natural fit for Clemson, Florida State. Their passion for football, their success historically in football would make a lot of sense. And then you'd look at the Big Ten, okay, North Carolina, Virginia, tremendous academic institutions, they would feel like a very natural fit. But at the same time, man, there's a lot of other schools right now that I think would be advantageous to the Big Ten's further expansion. We've already heard about Washington and Oregon being vetted and being cleared as potential candidates in the event in which the Big Ten wants to expand. But is the Big Ten really going to benefit by expanding into the Pacific Northwest? Perhaps down the road. But according to sources that I talk to, the Big Ten would actually feel better about the possibility of expanding down the eastern seaboard. That's why I think Florida State, Miami, Clemson, North Carolina, NC State, Virginia, what have you, those would be the schools. And those schools, I think, would be more likely at this point to align with the Big Ten than they would the SEC. Now, conversely, I think the SEC would stand to benefit greatly by adding the likes of NC State and Virginia Tech. You're going to say, well, why do you say that? Because NC State, to me, feels an awful lot like Texas A&M did when they ultimately left the Big 12. They have a rabid fan base. They absolutely love their sports. I think about Carter Finley. If you have Alabama traveling to Carter Finley, just how crazy and chaotic that environment would be, it'd be absolutely terrific. And then I think about Blacksburg as well, that environment their passion for college sports, it does feel very much like it would align with the SEC culture. I think those are natural fits. So you think about the SEC's possible expansion. Everyone says Clemson. Everyone says Florida State. Well, yes, I understand why culturally they would make some sense. I don't know if it would for sure make the most sense financially. However, getting into North Carolina, getting into Virginia could benefit the Southeastern Conference down the road. Where does this kind of leave everything? Right now, here's exactly what has to happen. It's $120 million if any of these schools want to leave their grant of rights early. And then there's a situation where every single one of these schools, their home games would actually still be owned and operated under the ACC umbrella. Now, there are lawyers that are looking at this line by line. And I'm not a lawyer. I'm not trying to pretend like I know all the inner workings. I have sources. I have people I talk to. I know that there is a huge groundswell of support amongst the Magnificent Seven to ultimately leave. But if they leave, will they immediately align with a new conference? That's something that a lot of people are not necessarily suggesting. If you talk to people in industry sources over the last several years, part of what led to where we're at right now in the conference realignment world was the fear that Texas, Oklahoma, USC, and UCLA, that they would actually 
go independent like Notre Dame. There was a fear that if those schools, that five school coalition decided to go independent, then they could down the road potentially go and poach schools like Georgia and Alabama and Michigan and Ohio State. There were fears of a handful of schools deciding to forego the conference model and go down the independent rabbit hole. There was fear of that. There were people that thought that was a real possibility. Could that become a possibility as it relates to the ACC schools that are really unhappy? Where they go and start selling game by game, like BYU did for a million years, like Notre Dame continues to do forever. Could they go game by game and become an independent? Because right now in the college football playoff era, Independence, while you can't get a first round bye, while you might have a home playoff game, your access to the playoff is very much real, even if you are without a conference affiliation. So independence is very much on the table if they can figure out the grant of rights situation. That's something that you need to be aware of. Will they ultimately go that route? I don't know. I think it depends which schools are being vetted by which conferences. And at this point, talking to the people that I've talked to, I don't get the sense that the SEC is really mobilizing to expand. The Big Ten, however, would be very open to expanding, but the place that they would be most open to would be in the state of Florida. That would be advantageous to NBC, that would be advantageous to Fox, and that would also be advantageous to CBS. Those are the three media rights holders for the Big Ten. So that's something to keep an eye on. The Big Ten, I think, is far more likely to expand right now. The SEC, not so much. They will kind of see exactly how this all plays out and what these ACC schools ultimately decide to do. Macro, you mentioned you know, the Big Ten and the SEC on how they're going about it. I think we know from past realignment that it's the presidents that contact the commissioners for to gauge interest if they can join the leagues. Is that still true? Very much. How it operates? I think it is to a certain extent. I don't know exactly how it it all goes down. It's a chicken egg situation. I think there's probably, it's not that dissimilar, and I don't know this with any factual argument, but it's it's not really that dissimilar to when players are on another team and they hear from their camp, if you will, hey, you know, just so you know, there's a scholarship open and there's an opportunity to compete at fill in the blank university. If you enter the portal, there might be a home for you over here. I would imagine that it's something like that. I don't think these commissioners are actively going and pursuing other places. I think it's the presidents at these universities that are initiating the conversation. Now, obviously there's a ton of red tape. There's a ton of red tape that you have to sort through when addressing whether or not you can leave, whether it makes financial sense. And we think about Texas. Let's use them as the best example because they, at one point, were aligned with the Pac-12, decided to stay put in the Big 12, launched the Longhorn Network, basically forced both Texas A&M and Missouri to leave the SEC, became disgruntled with where the Big 12 was heading and ultimately left the Big 12 in favor of leaving for the SEC in 2024. But remember, their grant of rights deal didn't expire until 2025. And it took a ton of money and an agreement between the Big 12, the SEC, Texas, and Oklahoma took a lot of money and an agreement for them to be able to get out of their rights deal just one year early, let alone 12 years down the road. So if we're talking about 12 years and the possibility where you could leave and yet the ACC would still retain the rights to your home games, where does that leave you? So I think it's going to be fascinating to watch. And if you really look at all the brands, okay, all the brands, I think most people would look at the brands. And if you're unfamiliar with who the Magnificent Seven, I'll tell you yet again just who they are. You have Florida State, Clemson, North Carolina, NC State, Virginia, Virginia Tech, and Miami. All right, those are the seven that are contemplating the possibilities of moving on. Of those seven brands... What's the best brand? Because I think beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Because to me, if I'm the Big Ten, the brand that I would most want to be a part of our footprint 
would be North Carolina. But if I'm the SEC, I don't know if I view it through the same lens. If I'm the SEC, I think getting into North Carolina would be really valuable, but I don't know if North Carolina would be the right fit for the league. I am probably in a different line of thinking than most, having called games in Raleigh, having been to Raleigh, having covered Raleigh, having lived in Charlotte for a vast majority of years and interacted with NC State fans as much, if not more than anybody, they love to hate more than they love to love. And guess what? The SEC fan bases mostly do. They love to hate, man. So I think NC State actually makes more sense for the SEC than North Carolina. But North Carolina, Virginia, to me, feel like the perfect fit for the Big Ten. Virginia Tech, NC State feel like the perfect fit to me for the SEC. It's just a matter of whether or not the SEC wants to expand further in the state of Florida. Are they benefited from adding Clemson in the state of South Carolina? Are they benefited from adding Florida State there in the state of Florida? And what does Miami do? Because I could see Miami being the fact that it's a private institution. I think they could actually be at the top of the top of the pecking order for the Big Ten if they want to expand into the state of Florida. So a lot of moving parts here, a lot of speculation. We all have sources and every single one of my sources has a little bit of a different opinion as to how this is all going to sort itself out. You want me to make my opinion right now known? I think within the next three years, every single one of the aforementioned seven schools will be out of the ACC. I think 2026, you wipe the slate clean. There's a new playoff format that will be in vogue at that point. Granted, yes, we have the 12-team playoff in 24 and 25. 26, everything essentially gets wiped clean. I think at that point, these schools will probably break away. And then I'm not sure exactly what they're going to do from that point forward. Do they align with a conference immediately or do they play independent? But I anticipate movement coming because where there's smoke, when it comes to these sort of things, there is fire. Now it's about whether or not their lawyers can find a loophole to get them out for a little bit cheaper than what would originally be anticipated. All right, let me ask you this, because we've seen the SEC dominate. And I'm talking, you know, not just in, in, in football, but in a lot of sports, okay? If you're the Big Ten, you've had one big bell cow for the last 15 years, and that's Ohio State. Michigan, recently, a little bit better. New commissioner, do you want to be aggressive if you're the Big Ten and say, fine, you know, if SEC is not going to make the move, we're going to go down. We're going to go to Florida State. We're going to go to Miami. We're going to get North Carolina. Hey, we're going to try to get Notre Dame. And at the same time, we're also going to go out west. We have every big major brand left on the table underneath our umbrella. Do you see the Big Ten trying to make that move? I think the Big Ten will absolutely consider that move. It's just at what point does there become a certain redundancy with the brands that you're adding? And at what point is when you are paying each one of your schools just for simple math purposes, let's say each school is making $100 million a year in the Big Ten. Now, that's not exactly what it is, but just for simple math purposes, it's less than that. I don't know if it's 82, 85, whatever it is. Let's just say for simplicity purposes, every school makes 100. Well, is adding both North Carolina and North Carolina State are both those teams. When you add them to the Big Ten, do they add $200 million worth of value? If you add Virginia and Virginia Tech, do they add $200 million worth of value? I would argue right now, while yes, in hoops, North Carolina, Virginia, great basketball programs. Florida State, great basketball program. Miami, great basketball program. But let's not lose sight here. Football is what ultimately moves the needle. Now, you can tell me, well, the basketball is revenue generating. Absolutely it is. It's big. Really, really big. It's the second most profitable sport by a wide margin, but it pales in comparison to the profitability of each one of these college football programs, including that of North Carolina. One of the biggest basketball brands in the land, doesn't matter. Their football program generates far more revenue for their school on a year in, year out basis. Same can be said with Virginia. Same can be said with Duke, even, even though they're not part of the Magnificent Seven. Duke football actually makes way more money than Duke basketball. So a lot of things that are in play here, but don't let basketball success get in the way or cloud your assessment of whether or not these teams 
are going to be included in the next round of realignment. Basketball matters, but not to the same extent that football does when it comes to these decisions that are being made. All right, I got one more just because this topic is fascinating. I mean, we were there and we remember SEC media days when it was announced that Texas and Oklahoma were going to be joining the conference. And we remember how frustrated it came across that Texas A&M was. Um, Would anybody in the SEC, would it matter if South Carolina and Georgia were like, listen, we don't want Clemson in the SEC. Uh, If Florida is like, listen, we don't want Florida State or Miami in the SEC. This is our state. Is that going to, would that have any impact and change any decisions that could be made? Well, it's still a majority rules. So here's, I think, something that I don't know if it got to Ross Bjork and the Texas A&M administration. I don't know exactly how it all went down, but here's the sales pitch that I would use to anybody that was trying to block someone else's admission. Say, if you put up a strong fight, you are giving off the indication that you are concerned about your own well-being if this school enters the league. So, I guess making it a little bit more digestible, if you put up a big fight, you're going to give off the impression that you're scared. And I don't think that's the impression that anybody wants to put off when talking about the possibility of expansion. If I'm Georgia, if I'm South Carolina and Clemson's on the table, hey, bring them on, man. We've been playing in this league for a long time. We know exactly how the cookie's made. Like, hey, if you're Florida, bring on Florida State. We, we've we been in this league. We know how this league operates. We're going to be just fine whether they're in the league or not. So those would be the messaging that I would advise these schools to use because I think if you try to block someone's admittance, it only gives off a negative impression. So I think it's a real question. I think it's a real possibility. But I also think too, it's one that most athletic directors will be at the table and presidents will be at the table making these decisions. So when you look at it, I mean, do you have to have unanimous consent for another team to enter in? Uh, I don't know the specifics to that. But I would imagine that if Clemson was really on the table, and say 12 out of the 14 or 14 out of the 16 athletic directors and presidents were on board with them joining the SEC, that they would ultimately join the SEC because I think everyone would ultimately get on board. But I don't think it's going to be an obvious slam dunk for Clemson and Florida State in the SEC. I don't. I don't think it's an obvious slam dunk that North Carolina and Virginia are going to join the Big Ten. Because right now, those contracts are so significant. They are so, so, so significant that you really better bring an awful lot to the table if you're going to be added in on a pro rata basis. Because all these television partners, they're the ones that are having a lot of say in this as well. Are they going to justify, hey man, we, you know, we're paying for the 16 team Big Ten, we're paying $1.6 billion dollars Now you're going to add teams that don't move the needle to the tune of $100 million each. Yeah, we're good with that school. We're not good with that school. We're good with that school. We're not good with that school. I think Florida for the Big Ten would be very, very, very appealing. I don't know this for sure, but I would anticipate if the Big Ten can expand into Florida and ultimately along the eastern seaboard, that would be really appealing because then you cast an umbrella over the SEC. I think they would definitely consider that. But the SEC is probably going to be a little bit more strategic because they don't necessarily need to have multiple teams from the exact same part of the country. If they can get to North Carolina or Virginia, great. I think they'd be very intrigued by that possibility. But adding secondary schools, not secondary, but schools in the same footprint, I'm not sure it does enough to justify their inclusion at this point, given where things are. All right, and I got one more here just because I'm trying to think, wrap my head around this. What about the other ACC teams, the the Dukes, Wake Forest, Pittsburgh, Syracuse? I mean, it, is Brett Yormark on the phone as soon as he finds out it's leaving and like, hey, come join the Big 12 and we're a coast-to-coast conference? Is, is it worth them? Like, what do you think their options might be? I think the Big 12, based on what Brett Yormark's done, Yormark's done up to this point, I think they're going to remain outrageously aggressive. Now, are they yet getting to the point where they're adding the four corner schools 
Uh, are they yet getting to the point where they continue their expansion? Uh, I don't know. But I think Brett Yormark is waiting in the wings. And the first opportunity he gets to potentially add to his footprint, the Big 12, based on what he's done already up to this point in a very short tenure, uh, I think he's terrific. And I would expect him to go after every remaining school extremely hard to strengthen a league that's already done a great job of surviving what's been very turbulent times. Since we're hot on the topic of the business today, let's keep it in the family. Talk briefly about what's going on with the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Their apparel deal is set to expire here momentarily with Under Armour. Now, this gets a little bit intriguing, and I thought it was a fascinating piece by Andy Staples on The Athletic on some of the possibilities down the road for the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Now, naturally, they've been with Under Armour for quite a while. They just recently, Under Armour that is, just recently bailed early on their deal with UCLA. UCLA signed a 15-year, $280 million apparel deal with Under Armour. Ultimately, Under Armour broke that off, and ultimately they ended up paying nearly a $68 million settlement to UCLA to get out of the deal a little bit early. Now, there have been some aspects of this that are a little unique to the NIL era. When you look at all of these things, how much are the jerseys actually worth? That's a big question mark. And a lot of these companies, Jordan Brand, Nike, Adidas, those are the three big players at this point. You used to have Russell Athletic, you used to have all these others that one point were very involved in the apparel, apparel game. But at this point, man, I don't know if we are entering into a new world with NIL where these deals are going to be quite as lucrative. Players want to spat their cleats. Players want to have their own shoe deals. Players want to have all this other stuff that would compensate the player as opposed to the school. So it's been already proposed by other people. Maybe Nike goes after this apparel deal with Notre Dame. However, the shoe deal is left up to each individual player. Let me tell you why I don't think this is going to work out. Because everybody wants to point to the idea that, well, Zion Williamson, think about what his shoe deal would have been with Nike if he had had the opportunity to negotiate it independently. Yes, that is the outlier. That is the outlier. I'll tell you what my shoe deal was in the NFL. When I was with the New York Jets, remember, massive market. I was a seventh round pick, so I was far from a high priority guy, but I played quarterback and the shoe deal is actually pretty dang lucrative. My deal was $15,000 in Nike equipment every single year. That, that's it. So you got Nike equipment, it was trade, and that's what you got. So anybody that's suggesting, well, you know, a hot recruit that would go to Notre Dame can negotiate his own shoe deal... Great. In basketball, sure, that's a possibility. Basketball is a remarkably lucrative avenue for the shoe game. But football, the only shoes that I can really think of off the top of my head that sold like wildfire were the Ladanian Tomlinson's back in the day. There's some Jordan shoes out there now that are used as cleats, but for the most part, football shoe deals pale in comparison to what you would see for a basketball player. So if they want to go this route, I think they're possibly leaving a decent amount of money on the table. And I think the players might not necessarily realize that they're not going to get a lot of cash. They'll get free gear, they'll get trade, but cash is likely to come way on down the road when you can prove that you're a starter, when you can prove that you're a difference maker on a team that's going to move the needle. So if this goes down, it'll be interesting to watch. If they sell their appeal deal, their deal, their apparel deal separately without the shoes, it'll be interesting to see if that's the first kind of thing to go down in this new look NIL era as it relates to the apparel world. So something to keep an eye on, something to watch, but one that I don't think is necessarily in the best interest of Notre Dame, and I don't think it's necessarily going to pay off the way some have anticipated it paying off if they do allow each individual player to sign their own deals. Isn't it just a little different though? I mean, we, we know the NIL deals, we know the collectives. 
isn't it a way to say, again, you're a quarterback. So it's basically looking at the top 10 quarterback prospects and saying, hey, come to this school. You know, Nike can give you a shoe deal. And this way, if and when you do make it, and typically, you know, if you're a top five quarterback, you do make it to the NFL. They don't have to worry about you wearing Under Armour, you wearing Reebok at another school. Do you think that plays into anything that maybe the sales pitch that Nike and or Notre Dame might have? Well, let's think about the turnover rate. So you sign an apparel deal with Under Armour that is going to, you're going to get Under Armour cleats. That's great. But guess what? In a year, you transfer because you're not the starting quarterback. Now you're playing for a Nike school and you're expected to wear Nike cleats because that deal is not carved out. So no, I don't think it's, I don't think it benefits you whatsoever. I think once upon a time, it was a little bit bigger deal back in the day say early 2010s, gear and merch and swag was a huge part of why some guys went to some schools. I don't think it's quite as big a deal anymore. And I also think these shoe companies, they're in the business of making money. They're not going to start outfitting guys that are three, maybe four years away from potentially getting to the NFL and potentially being a difference maker as a first round pick. And even if you do, I know what Mark Sanchez made. I know what Tim Tebow made. I know what those guys made on their shoe deals. And it's not as exorbitant as you might think. It's not bad money by any stretch of the equation. It's great money. But I don't think it would be in the best interest of Notre Dame to carve that piece out. Because ultimately, if you make a lot of money on your apparel deal and it's head to toe, jersey, pants, shoes, that is ultimately going to benefit the player down the road as opposed to a couple thousand dollars here and there in trade or in merch. So personally, I'd rather have the cash as the university and put it into the facilities and put it into the player experience as opposed to carving out that little piece for them. And they just get a couple bucks here and there in trade to where it probably wouldn't go that far to begin with. As always, we try to get to our mailbag as often as humanly possible. So continue to send in unbelievable questions. We so appreciate everything that you guys send in already. Always collegefootball at gmail.com. Always CFB on both Instagram and on Twitter. So Coobs, where are we going today? All right. First question comes from Jerry in Arizona. What are your thoughts on the Big 12 playing football and basketball games in Mexico in the near future? I love it. I think it makes all the sense in the world. We talked earlier about how aggressive Brett Yormark has been when it comes to expanding the brand that is the Big 12. I think it makes a ton of sense. Now, I look at these games that are being played internationally for the NFL, in some ways in college football, and I look at the NFL games in particular involving the Dallas Cowboys and the Arizona Cardinals and just how successful some of the games have been in Mexico City or other parts around Mexico. And I look at the jerseys that are being worn to those venues for these games. You'll look at a game in London and you'll see a Kansas City jersey, even though it's Jacksonville against the Giants. You'll see games in Germany where they're wearing an LA Chargers jersey and a Denver Broncos jersey even though the two teams that are involved are the New York Jets and the Cincinnati Bengals. Because right now, people in those countries, people in that part of the world, they're starved for football. They've had a taste of it. They've gotten to watch some of it, but they haven't got to experience what it's like to go to a venue and to support some of those NFL teams. Now, ramp that up even more. College football experience in the environment itself is something that we can all align with. It's a great, great, great sport to see in person. So the opportunity to expand your footprint, and if you take, say, BYU against UCF, they won't, I think, miss a beat whatsoever. Any football game being played in Mexico is going to be one that is watched and consumed by thousands, and in some cases, by millions of people around the country. And if you can expand your footprint, if you can expand the knowledge within Mexico about your programs that are under your Big 12 umbrella, that is going to be beneficial in the long term as we continue to grow as a sport. I don't think college football is ever going to be a sport that is international. 
I don't think it's ever going to be one where we start playing a ton of games in Europe or a ton of games in Mexico, but you take one or two a year and you play them down there and you can potentially influence a 9, 10, 11, 12-year-old kid that's never seen a college football game with his own two eyes and now all of a sudden he's a diehard UCF fan because he got to see them play. That to me, I think, is a really cool opportunity for the Big 12. So I'm really excited about what Brett Yormark is doing to position his teams and his league to play some of those games in places where there are fans that are dying to find allegiances. As we've told you before, there's absolutely no offseason. Not anymore, man. There used to be a time where you'd put college football up on the shelf and you could take a couple months, especially in the summer, or right after the season to just decompress and to get away from it. But no longer, man, with the NIL world, with the portal, with realignment discussions, with new television rights deals that are being put out there. It's unbelievable how much movement is taking place on a day-to-day basis in the sport that we love so much. That's why we're going to be here for you. We're not going anywhere. We're 60 days out from media days getting underway. A lot can happen in those 60 days and always college football will keep you looped in as much as humanly possible between now and then because we all know that media days is the unofficial start of the 2023 season so keep it locked in right here on always college football by subscribing by liking by rating all this stuff you can do all that both on youtube and you can do it on our podcast you can get it anywhere where you get your podcast. So continue to keep it locked in. We appreciate you. It helps us out and helps the show out as well. For all of us here at Always College Football, for Mark, Jack, Jake, I'm Greg. We hope you have a wonderful day. And remember, it's Always College Football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.